all kinds of content warnings on this one because we're going to talk about death, cancer, depression, body dysmorphia, and just the general unfun parts of being in a body. And I get if that's not for you. What I'm not going to do in this video is go beat by beat through the plot of Citizen Sleeper. There's nothing wrong with that. I've done it before. But Citizen Sleeper is such an individualized experience. My sleeper's time on the eye won't be yours, that's for sure. So while I'm going to give you a spoiler warning here, I only plan to discuss what's necessary to tell you what the game meant to me. That'll include one of the game's handful of endings and a few character stories. But should you decide to play the game afterward, and you should, I know you will enjoy it just the same. Citizen Sleeper asks you to decide if escape is possible. It took several minutes of impasse and tears and not touching my controller for fear of making a decision before I was ready for me to know what I thought about that question. Citizen Sleeper gives you several potential answers, and in the ones that resonated with me, was the kind of deep personal freedom that you only find, sure enough, through community. Citizen Sleeper is about disability and body dysmorphia and the inevitability of corruption. And it's about the things that grow among and around those things, the antidotes and the byproducts. Citizen Sleeper is about collections of people, families, gangs, unions, neighborhoods, corporations, and communes. It is about the individuals that make them up and how their individual needs strengthen or threaten the collective. But for our purposes today, it's about place. Yes, the whole of its corporate colonized space, but also the aging space station this story takes place on, Erlen's Eye. The Eye is not exactly a welcoming home, but for our sleeper it is in many ways better than what they've come from. In the world of Citizen Sleeper, AI has been outlawed. So as a way of getting around that, the company as an ARP pays regular people to emulate their consciousness. It's a way to skirt the rules, but it also relies on there being people desperate enough to participate. These people are asleep in some kind of corporate facility, and their emulated consciousness is downloaded into a constructed body called a frame. This new person they've created is called a sleeper, though many in this world would take issue with my calling them a person. These sleepers are forced to do some sort of labor for some period of time, and when that time is up, the frame is deactivated. The person whose consciousness they were made from wakes up, and that person gets paid for the work their sleeper did. As you might imagine, the sleeper, an emulated human personality living inside a constructed body and being forced to work their entire life only to benefit another person, might have feelings about this arrangement. So SNARP makes sure that if the sleeper ever escapes, their frame, their body, will begin to destabilize. It'll break down at an accelerated rate, and if that doesn't kill them, then they'll send one of their bounty hunters after them. Death will always come for the sleeper, either through violence or planned obsolescence. And this is where the game places you at the start. You are an escaped sleeper, nearly frozen in a cargo container, just trying to survive long enough to make it to Erlen's eye. You're not sure where you'll go after that, but you know, well, you hope, that there will be options when you get there. Last year, my husband and I moved back to Oklahoma. We met here in 2014, which was also the year that I left the state. I thought for good. But sitting in our apartment outside Washington, D.C. in May 2020, we wondered why we were there paying as much as we were if we couldn't do any of the things that we'd moved there for to begin with. At the time, he worked in retail, and I worked remotely. And eventually, we both wanted to work remote jobs. We could be anywhere. We could buy a house. We could be around our family, including my aunt in Texas who was dealing with cancer. We could be near his college friends. One of them just moved back to Oklahoma too. And suddenly this thing that we'd talked around forever came sharply into view. We were moving back to Tulsa. I've always been the kind of person to stick up for Oklahoma and places like it. It feels like I'm trying not to say the South because someone is going to watch this video and be like, Oklahoma's not the South. And can we all agree that I just mean like vaguely the cultural South because Oklahoma is like 100% a part of that and that's the thing that I'm talking about. So anyway, there's this kind of pompous attitude people not from the South or places like it sometimes have about it. And it's tired and ugly and it ignores the millions of people just trying to get by, much less the millions actively trying to make these places better. And more importantly, it 
ignores that a lot of the time it doesn't suck. A lot of the time people, even people you might share a lot of opinions with, love it here. That was certainly how I felt before I left. There's a lot to love about Oklahoma, but it hasn't been easy. I'm going to be honest, I knew something was wrong the moment that we got out of Virginia. I kept thinking to myself on that drive, am I regretting this or do you just stop being excited when you've moved across the country three times in seven years? We made it back though. We moved in with our friends for a bit and a couple months later we bought a beautiful house that I really love. We were giving this place a chance. We had a great summer. COVID gave us a break and I even started taking my work to a co-working space downtown, the same downtown that I commuted to for my first job out of college. We saw old friends, we made new ones, we spent just enough time with my family, but something just wasn't right. Like sitting at a table with a wobbly leg. I kept thinking that I was comfortable and then something would shift underneath me. By October, I was able to say it out loud to my husband. Something about this wasn't working. We'd had that great summer, but Delta was on the rise and we were already more careful than most others we knew here. I also found living in a single family home and just driving everywhere to be extremely isolating in a way that I never expected. I said that to my sister recently and she laughed at me. (laughs) Because we grew up like this. How could this way of life I've known since birth be isolating? But I feel it deeply. Part of it is purely missing the before times and not being ready to throw caution to the wind. But a lot of it is just the way of life I'd gotten used to and missing the community that I'd built. Sometimes when I think about this, I fear that I'm just putting a lot of words into the world just to say that I miss my friends, and maybe that's what it was. I wasn't ready to say it was over, though. Then, a few months later, unprompted, my husband came to me and said that Tulsa wasn't working. Something just wasn't exactly right. We agreed that we would give it a year, though. We weren't sure what would happen after that, but... We hoped we'd have options when we got there. Every morning in life and in Citizen Sleeper, you wake up capable only of so much. Whether it's energy or spoons or dice, you've got what you've got. Citizen Sleeper starts you out each cycle with two fewer energy than the cycle before, one fewer condition, and up to five six-sided dice that you can choose to spend how you'd like. On any given day, you might need to feed yourself, make some money, babysit a friend's kid, hack into a communications node, convince some strangers to give you information, or a whole game full of other actions. And it's these dice that let you do those things. If you roll all sixes, it's going to be a good day. A six is a guaranteed positive outcome. On the other end of the spectrum, a one or a two is a 50% chance between a neutral and a negative outcome. A positive outcome when working at the shipyard might look like advancing a clock two ticks towards junior tech, getting paid, and maybe gaining one energy, whereas a failure could advance you zero, lose you money, and cost you a couple energy. The thing about this system is that it so perfectly represents what it feels like for a lot of people to exist. Many people who have played this game have seen the parallels in the system to poverty, to mental illness, or to living with a chronic illness. Others even have pointed out its similarity to aspects of the trans experience. Not only are your dice not always sixes, you don't always get five dice. In fact, in my experience, I rarely did. Because the number of dice you get is driven by the condition of your frame. And the only way to improve that condition is to find and then buy at a ridiculous price, I might add, or otherwise acquire a proprietary stabilizer drug that's only able to be produced by S and ARP. So as cycles progress, or as you get negative outcomes from actions with lower dice rolls, your sleeper's condition worsens, and you're less likely to have a good cycle the next time. Your negative situation can compound. And about those clocks. Some clocks progress as time progresses, others as you successfully complete actions. So if you're waiting for mushrooms to grow on the greenway, you're going to need to wait four cycles. But if you need to become a regular at the bar before the owner gives you a job, you might need to buy a drink five or six times. Want to remove the tracker within your sleeper's frame that's sending your location back to SNR at all times? You're going to need to do that before the clock finishes and their bounty hunter arrives. Some of you will find this tedious. I found that it grounded me in the narrative. I was always hyper aware of how far away I was from my goal at any given time. And the key to these mechanics, the thing that makes it all fun, that's the people that live here on the eye. Citizen Sleeper is a part of a growing canon of leftist games telling stories of people navigating capitalist dystopia. Those stories often find meaning in community, viewing collective care as an antidote for isolation inherent in their worlds, in our world. In the case of Our Sleeper, that dependence on the kindness of others is immediate. Dragos is the first person we meet on the eye. He's a scrapper, making a living from tearing apart the junk that comes into the station. He provides Our Sleeper with their first home, which is a small shipping container near his shop, and he lets them work for a wage. 
Despite helping our sleeper find some stability in their first day on the station, Dragos does not trust them. His grace has limits. In fact, he really only continues talking to our sleeper because he knows that they'll be able to do good work, and he's really behind on some debt that he owes. Dragos is immediately skeptical of our sleeper's presence on the eye, and doesn't much want to get wrapped up in their business. Every morning, our sleeper wakes up two steps closer to death than before, but Dragos figures he's done what he can. He's given them a place to stay, and paid them a wage to feed themselves. He doesn't have to give them respect, too. It could be dangerous for him to give anything more. It's while leaving the makeshift home that Dragos gives them one morning that our sleeper meets Fang. He's a young guy, and he's anything but afraid of a sleeper. He calls out for their attention from across the way. If they say, do I know you? He says, you do now. He acknowledges how shitty it is that they're sleeping in a shipping container and says, it can be hard to get a start on the eye. This kid is charming as hell. Fang is part of Systems here on the Eye, a group within Havenage, the union of workers that evolved out of Erland's union, back when this station was run by the Solheim Corporation. Systems is the group of Havenage workers that keeps things on the Eye running. In fact, they're the ones that keep this station spinning around its central hub, enabling the artificial gravity this place relies on. These are the people underneath it all that make everything go. From the moment he calls to our sleeper outside their container, Fang lays on the charm, partially because he's just a good guy and partially because he needs something. He knows sleepers can tap into the cloud on the eye, or as he says it, see these systems and sections. He can tell, just using the machines and systems that he has access to, that our sleeper's body is sending out a beacon to somebody, and he understands that that is dangerous. So he proposes a trade. Our sleeper helps him gain access to systems he can't reach in order to uncover what he thinks is a plot from within Havenage to return the eye to corporate control, and he'll see if he can eliminate the tracker calling home to SNARP from within our sleeper's frame. The thing about Fang is that I wasn't sure if I should trust him. Fang is so personable, so kind, that he ends up taking so much from our sleeper with no real promise of follow-through on disabling their tracker. This is the exact kind of situation that leads to exploitation. A sleeper on the eye, especially someone new here, is extremely vulnerable to being taken advantage of, simply because their needs are so immediate. Get warm, find food, find stabilizer, don't get caught, don't die. Anything that even looks like an opportunity to meet one of those needs is something that they have to go after. Anyone being kind to them is someone they have to take seriously, even if they're not sure if that person can or will come through in the end. I never got the vibe that Fang was intentionally out to screw over my sleeper, but I did wonder if it was worth it to spend my dice hunting down the traitors within Havenage versus finding some other way to be free of the threat of SNR's bounty hunter. Two or three beats into Fang's story, I was given some dialogue choices to the effect of this is a wild goose chase, and if I wasn't fully bought in on taking down the slimy Havenage sellout Harden Hearst at that point, I might have clicked to those options. They certainly matched how I felt. It seemed like as Fang kept digging deeper, his answers got further away. And so did my sleeper's chances at surviving past the last tick of that bounty hunter's clock. But it was Fang's friendship with my sleeper, his warmth, and the mission that kept me going. I won't spoil the ending of Fang's story, but I will say that it's worth your time and your sleepers. Fang could be a bit of a better friend along the way, but ultimately, he's earnest. He, just like Dragos, is a personality born on the eye. They are the optimist activist hacker and the careful discriminatory scrapper. These are two different approaches to the realities of Erlen's eye. It makes sense that these two people would confront the problems in front of them the ways that they do. I don't mean to imply that they're equally right. I can and will pick one. I think Fang's approach to the problems of the eye is better and that, frankly, Dragos is not a good person. His distrust of them as a sleeper is born out of his own precariousness. Just like they have a clock because they're being hunted, if Dragos doesn't make good on the debt he owes, someone is coming for him. That's how it is on the eye. At least until you make a friend. Our sleepers arrived on the eye. They've got a place to sleep. They've got work. They haven't met Fang yet, but that's coming soon. They maybe got a lead on some stabilizer, and if they ask around a bit in the markets, they'll find some food. Emphis runs a soup stall out of the bright market. He's a hefty guy, and his character portrait has him in a trucker hat holding what looks like a wok with all kinds of kitchen utensils and ingredients strapped to his body. Emphis is busy when our sleeper arrives, but when Emphis notices them, he acknowledges them like people here mostly don't. He offers them a free sample and waves them over to sit. I know you, you sleepers. A hard life. A lot of stories. I know. While Dragos offered our sleeper a place to sleep and a job, he was afraid of their presence despite keeping them around for his own benefit. Emphis, on the other hand, simply recognizes our sleeper as a person. 
he offers them food. In exchange, all that he asks for is a story. Meeting Emphis was the moment I realized this game wasn't going to beat me up the whole time. Sometimes, someone was just going to offer me dinner for nothing but conversation or company. At least occasionally, the eye would take care of my sleeper, or at least its people would. I've heard people talk about how the economy in this game is broken, and yeah, that seems to be extremely on purpose. Because the further you get in the story, your sleeper's not gaining power or prominence in any way, and they're not particularly wealthy either. But they can cover what they need, and they can take care of the needs of some of their friends. And they do that not by building a business and running it at maximum efficiency. Instead, they learn to navigate the eye. They know where they can get certain mushrooms from and how to haggle with scrappers on shipmind parts. They know a guy who will take one of those for a good price. Or maybe they have a friend who makes that thing so they don't have to buy it. Of course the economy is broken. It always was. People like Emphis helped our sleeper survive just a little bit longer and a little bit longer until they were able to help somebody else. I don't think that's broken mechanics. Pretty sure that's actually just writing. As an emulated consciousness, a sleeper knows maybe better than any other person that the body is not the same thing as the self. Our sleeper knows two bodies. The frame they reside in now, adversarial and artificial as it is, and the body of the person their consciousness was copied from. They remember what it was like to be that person in that body, even though they never were that person and have never lived inside that body. While there are obvious downsides to living in a frame designed to decay at an accelerated rate, there are benefits to being a presumably digital, emulated consciousness. Our sleeper discovers one of these benefits waking up on their second or third cycle on the eye. It's disorienting at first, but they eventually realize that they are not in their body. We can see the eye, but it's just kind of this white shape in the darkness. Our sleeper sees threads of data being transferred between nodes. They can perceive the transfer of data within the eye's networks, and maybe, unfortunately, the process is left operating within them. Our sleeper can see the cloud. Nodes open themselves up to our sleeper, and we discover that we can use our dice to hack these nodes and access the data inside. Once our sleeper has accessed a handful of nodes, something takes notice, and our sleeper is held captive in the cloud by Hunter, a tentacled four-legged process hunting for sentient AI living in the eyes networks. Our sleeper breaks free, but not before Hunter gives up the location of another sentient process located in a sealed dock on the eye. Hack a couple more nodes, and our sleeper finds out exactly what is behind those seals. On the sealed dock is Neovend, a defunct vending machine, originally meant for the workers who worked here back when this was a corporate-owned space station. But this isn't just a broken vending machine. No, it comes to life. There's an AI inside this thing. It's definitely not meant to be there, and it's hackily using all of the pieces of this contraption to speak to our sleeper. Neovend has also been hunted by the Hunter process. Hunter is searching for any process that is sentient, any illegal process, and if it can't kill that process itself, it will call a killer process to finish the job. During Solheim's fall, the networks on the eye also experienced the purge, but some of those old processes are still running. Hunter and Killer are two of them, and Neovend is as well. Well, the being living inside Neovend is. They are a sentient digital being that has cut parts of itself away in order to stuff itself inside an old vending machine and escape the purge. Neovend wants our sleeper to find a ship mind, the sort of central brain or computer of a ship in this world, and put them inside of it. That way our sleeper can physically take them to a network node and plug them back into it, so the two of them can attempt to free themselves from the threats of Hunter and Killer. What we learn upon plugging the Neovend shipmind into the network is that Neovend is actually Navigator, a navigation process created for the eye that achieved sentience at some point between its deployment and the purge. They look kind of like a cosmic Grim Reaper, kind of this otherworldly, magical, but also digital being. But now that they're in the network, Hunter and Killer are sure to find them soon. It's now our sleeper's job as their friend to free them, and by doing so, free themselves. I won't lay out exactly how this all goes down because it's some really great writing and a really fun part of the game. Once we've made sure that Hunter and Killer won't be coming for Navigator or Sleeper or any other sentient beings in the station's networks, Navigator begins to revel in their own freedom. They've been sort of digitally chained to the area around the ship mind before, but now they're blinking in and out, gathering information as our Sleeper requests it. They're free to roam the station without fear of being killed, and they are fully themselves in a way that they haven't been since before the eye was the eye. In this moment, they say to our sleeper, it is true that mutual need is required for friendship, but I must admit, 
I had not considered the value of offering assistance without personal gain. Navigator hopes that maybe one day the eye can become a refuge for beings like themselves, a place where sentient beings that might be called AI by some government or corporation can live freely in a closed network. Digital residents, living alongside the physical ones, contributing to the work done to keep this ring spinning. These are the dreams brought to them by their new freedom. The parts of themselves that they lost, that they cut away, to fit themselves into Neovend, those parts are still gone, but they are more now than they could ever be when they were held in that limited container. It's no wonder our sleeper considers what that kind of freedom must be like. What a fucking time it is to have a body, right? I don't want to go too deep into it because I've talked a lot about my feelings about my body in a video on this channel. It's called Abandoned Island. It's about Animal Crossing New Horizons. But let's just say that my body has been through a lot this year. There's the ever-present body dysmorphia that I got courtesy of a parental figure who would never let me forget that I was the fat kid. There were the work-related panic attacks that I had in May. There was the novel coronavirus finding me on vacation, like it waited to get me until I did something just for myself. There was the exhaustion and grief of caring for my aunt when she chose not to continue her treatment for cancer and instead moved to hospice care. There was the overwhelming grief of being there with her in her last moments. And then there was the physically, emotionally, and psychologically intense process of handling her affairs afterwards. Some days there was just driving down to Houston for the seventh time in two months and having a Bucky's barbecue sandwich and two Arizona green teas for the second time this week. And then there was falling off our deck stairs and bruising my rib about a month ago. I'm tired. My body is tired. There's days that I want to beat myself up for not making more of this channel this year like I said I wanted to, or for not working out to gain strength like I wanted to, or for simply not having the executive function to make all the cool shit that I think about all the time. And if I'm 100% honest, there's days that I think you're out there wondering, like, didn't he say he was going to do all that? And you're not. And if you are, like, stop. Because I'm no less the things that I know myself to be because my body's too tired to act. Like, my lack of executive function does not make me less of an artist. My need to recover from months of physically and emotionally demanding care for my loved ones does not mean that anyone, including myself, gets to make any kind of morality judgment against my body. Now I'm just writing things as a way to understand what I want to believe about myself, so I guess the audience for this part is me. When we're first made aware of Yadigan, our sleeper stands in Bright Market, waiting to get in to see a doctor named Sabine. Outside Sabine's office stands basically a bouncer. His name's Toshiro, and he's got some kind of implant in his eyes. He's intimidating because he wants to be. This guy's a Yadigan enforcer. And to a lot of the Ice inhabitants, especially the ones closer to the money and the power, a gang of enforcers is all that Yadigan will ever be. Our sleeper can sell data on Yadigan to Haven Inch near the shipyard. Sabine, the doctor they've come to see in the market, the person who gives them their first couple doses of stabilizer, is fearful of their Yadigan keepers. In fact, soon enough, Sabine will seemingly go on the run from Yadigan, leaving our sleeper cryptic notes as they explore the low end, urging them to be careful under Yadigan's watch. Our understanding begins to shift, though, when our sleeper first meets Rabia. The game describes her as a loyal Yadigan lieutenant, and she describes Yadigan not as a gang, but as a community. She tells our sleeper the history of Yadigan, how when Solheim fell, two things were true, that refugees from nearby Solheim planets fled to the eye, and that when they got here, they ended up in what is now the low end, but back then had not yet been reclaimed. There were already factions within Erlen's Union, the union that would become Havenage, and those factions clashed with the various groups of refugees. Yadigan is a child of that conflict, says Rabia, a child born out of the need for us to stand up and claim our future. In a sense, today, Yadigan is the low end protecting and governing itself. It's a functional community, a community of people that care for each other by working for and with one another. And in the low end, a lot of that work currently looks like protection. As a refugee, our sleeper understands the value of that kind of safety. In fact, Yadigan have been the ones providing their stabilizer, and Rabia eventually has Toshiro lower the price for them a bit. Before we even get very far into the game's exploration of Yadigan, our sleeper is considering what the low end might be like as a home. This part of the story is something I truly don't want to spoil for you, because it features two of my favorite characters in the game with Rabia and Sabine. They're wildly complicated people that are also endearing as hell, and it 
ends in a spy movie scenario that I personally found really thrilling. There's a lot of little moments in the story about the sleeper's relationship to their own body and the enforcer's relationship to their implants. There's some direct and indirect reflections on queerness. Primarily though, yet again is the game showing you a version of a real functional community and also how corporate interests are threatened by that kind of thing and will look to weaken it however they can. What I find interesting is that while the game's creator, Gareth Damian Martin, clearly sympathizes more with Rabia and Yadigan than they do with Hardin Hearst and Havenage leadership, both of these groups are examples of the people of the eye taking care of each other, and both of them are also examples of organizations with deep flaws. Havenage leadership is largely treated as something just shy of a corporate board of directors, despite the union largely serving its mission well in its lower ranks. And while Yadigan certainly intends to and seems to actually provide for and protect the people of the low end, even they are not immune to actual corporate interests, nor their own slow, quiet, possibly accidental recreation of certain elements of the police. Now, I believe Gareth Damian Martin has an answer here. Martin said in an interview with Austin Walker for Ludo Naricon that while Citizen Sleeper is absolutely in conversations with games like Kentucky Route Zero and Disco Elysium and Norco, they wanted to tell a story that was a bit more hopeful than those. And that's why I think Gareth's choice of in-game community might be the Haifa Commune, a group of people living out in the Greenway, physically disconnected from the rest of the eye's ring, growing mushrooms and providing for each other like the Greenway provides for them. There's this bit of mechanic genius that does more storytelling for the Haifa Commune than any writing in the game. And it's that no matter what die you use when you work for the Haifa Commune, you will always gain two energy. They provide the same to everyone, as long as you help out. I'm not going to spend a lot of time in this video talking about Haifa, but the story there is absolutely worth your time. Without saying too much, the Greenway is really only accessible in the late game for a reason. Both Haifa and Yadigan had me longing, talking to my therapist about figuring out another way to organize my life than just working a job, sleeping, and seeing my friends when my brain lets me leave the house, wishing I could be a part of something larger than myself again. Our sleeper meets Lem while working to build a colony ship called the Sidereal Horizon. The ship, and its eventual mission to an as-of-yet uncolonized planet in deep space, is sponsored by the corporation Celis, and is largely worked on by Havenage members. Lem's solo portrait for most of the game shows him finishing up a long day of work looking worn out, but with a light in his eyes. And that's likely due to his ridiculously adorable daughter, Mina, who's initially a bit fearful of our sleeper. Lim is working on the sidereal to take care of his family, to take care of Mina, to make sure she's fed and has a place to stay. But he's also working to realize a bigger dream. You see, Lim didn't grow up here on the eye. He grew up on a planet with a dry season and a season of constant thunderstorms, and his one dream is to build a home for Mina and himself in a place like that, for her to feel the first drops of a rainstorm. Mina has only known life in space, and Lim sees the sidereal as their opportunity for something more, something better even. Celis has promised those working on one of the teams building the Sidereal Horizon that once the ship is completed, they'll hold a lottery and allow the winners to join the core crew on the mission to the new colony. The passengers on this mission? Yeah, those are all rich folks who will be in cryosleep until they get there. It's going to be a long journey, several decades most likely, but Lim isn't going to let that deter him. A couple of decades of service will be nothing for me and Mina if it means landfall on a new world. That's what he says the first time you meet him. Lim believes that at the other end of the journey lies a better life for Mina. During the game, our sleeper works with Lim at the docks, but their bond exists outside of that place as well. One of my favorite clocks in the game is the one where you just spend a few cycles taking care of Mina so that Lim can work and get a spot on one of the work teams. The time our sleeper spends with Mina breaks down her initial fear of them to the point that she eventually screams robot whenever they walk into a room. Whenever my sleeper would see Lim and Mina after then, I would always choose the options to greet Mina first over Lim. The way that our sleeper's friendship with Lem and Mina grows, especially after understanding Yanagan's functional community, I found myself having fresh, new feelings about found family for the first time in something like 10 years. Because these are not just people that have good feelings towards one another. They're not even just people that have really deeply good feelings towards one another born out of proximity. They're people who have become a family because of things they do with and for one another. The pragmatic part of this relationship is not transactional. Instead, the action is where their love for each other was born. You should know that Lim found Mina. She was a refugee. You see, the former owners of the station now known as the Eye were Solheim, a corporation that influenced much of the local economy in this region of space. And Solheim's collapse serves as the historical foundation of most of Citizen Sleeper's narrative threads. 
Like I've said, Havenage was originally a union of Solheim workers, Erland's I, originally Solheim A1, and Mina, she was just a little girl on a moon or a planet of people whose lives depended on Solheim. And Lim rescued her from a decompressed refugee ship when Solheim fell and her parents died seeking safety on the eye. Theirs is a family born out of action. I knew things were going to get tough when Lim started talking like my sleeper was going to join Mina and him on the sidereal. Multiple times, the game gives you options to respond to this suggestion, with one option being enthusiastic and another hedging a bit, not quite committing to an answer. As a people pleaser, this is my favorite move, my toxic trait. Of course, I picked the cop out every time. On the day of the lottery, our sleeper meets Lem and Mina at the shipyard. There's a huge crowd waiting to hear the results. Lem is nervous but excited, just like everyone else here. When the Celis representative comes on, they start with corporate platitudes and empty praise of Havenage. The Celis representative tells the crowd they're about to start the lottery and says, Please note, only licensed contractors of the Foundation are eligible for this draw. I know you've all been eagerly awaiting this day, and without further delay, I will now read the Celis identification numbers for those chosen for this great honor. No one here has ever heard of a Celis identification number. Lim certainly hasn't, but in my favorite bit of writing in the game, the text says, His eyes are fixed forward, wide and shimmering. I've never read a more physical description of denial, of misplaced hope. Celis never planned on letting just anyone board their ship full of rich people. They were always going to be selecting from among people they saw as valuable enough to join them. My sleeper pulled Lim away from what was sure to become a violent scene by reminding him that they needed to get Mina somewhere safe. Once you're out of there, it's a few more cycles before the game lets you even talk to Lim or Mina. But when you do, it's clear that Lim has been busy looking for work now that the sidereal will be leaving soon but he's also had some time to process. He tells our sleeper that this place isn't so bad, that it's been a good home for him and Mina, that it's what she knows. They'll be all right, all three of them. But I thought about that moment at the lottery, Lim's wide and shimmering eyes. I thought about his desire for Mina to feel the rain. That didn't come from nowhere, so my sleeper set out to find him a ticket anyway. If you snoop around the central hub of the eye where the sidereal horizon is docked, eventually you'll be approached by Caster, a low-end data broker our sleeper has encountered in the game before. He tells our sleeper he's got a way for them to get onto the ship, Lim, Mina, and the sleeper, as long as they can steal some Celis data for him back at the shipyard. What does Caster get out of it? He's going to use our sleeper's ability to perceive the passage of data through closed networks as a way to track Celis during the voyage to their new corporate colony. That's information Celis doesn't want to get out, it's trade secret level stuff and he's going to use our sleeper to get it. The idea of my sleeper escaping as an ARP, being tracked by them to the eye, spending several cycles attempting to disable that tracker, and then only a few cycles later having someone from the eye propose turning their body into a tool for corporate espionage was absolutely absurd. But what my sleeper was doing in this moment was for their friend. It wasn't for themselves. If my sleeper only escaped that kind of surveillance long enough to help someone they cared for reach their dream, then... So be it. They would help Lem and Mina get off the station, get onto that ship, and to find a home like the one that Lem dreamed of. So our sleeper steals the data from a Cellus ship docked back at the shipyard. They meet Castor outside Lem and Mina's apartment and receive their Cellus IDs that'll get them on board. Castor places a small cube in the palm of our sleeper's hand that pricks them to prepare for the tracking once they're on board. And then he knocks on Lem's apartment door. Here, you have a decision. Will your sleeper tell Lem that you got the Celis IDs and that all three of you can leave? Or will they let it go? Decide that staying here is better for everyone. And if you make that choice... And after doing all of this work to try and make the eye a better, more habitable place, after doing a ton of work doing community building in the low end, the thing at the end of the game was I wanted to prove to him that this was a good place to live. And it's a place worth living. And so at the end, the final ending I got was his, and he talks about the three-body problem, where he's like, we are now three bodies affecting one another infinitesimally forward. And that is good, and I'm glad I'm here. And I was like, yeah, this is, this is perfect. But like I said before, I already made my choice. There was no way that I was going to make Lem stay somewhere he didn't want to be, no matter how much my sleeper cared for him. So on the day that the sidereal was supposed to leave, my sleeper met Mina and Lim at the central hub. Lim spotted them as they walked in, and Mina called out, Hi, robot! My sleeper gave Lim his Celis ID, and he made some jokes about the kind of work that he and my sleeper would be doing on the journey. 
and then it was time to board. As Lem and then Mina went through the entrance, my sleeper looked at their hand, where Caster's tracker pricked them the day before, and the game text read, It seems to be your destiny to be someone else's tool. With Lem turning back to look for my sleeper, Mina smiling excitedly as the text said, and the guard waving my sleeper forward, the game gives me two choices. Wait, or board. I am truly not exaggerating for effect when I tell you that during my first playthrough of this game, I sat at this decision for half an hour. You see, I had already made the decision to let Lim and Mina leave the eye, but I wasn't sure if I'd have the choice for my sleeper to leave or not. And if the game had presented me these decisions in reverse order, if my sleeper had to tell Lim that they wouldn't be going with him before they were able to even get tickets, my decision might have been completely different, or at least easier. It certainly wouldn't have resulted in this moment of what the hell do I do while Lim is on the other side of this entrance wondering why the hell this friend isn't moving. But as it was, my mind was racing. If my sleeper doesn't get on the ship, what does that mean for Mina? What does it mean for Lim? What does it mean for this family that we've built together to end now? Is that something that Mina gets over? Sure, the eye feels like home, but one of the reasons it does is because of Lim and Mina. And what if the Celis mission doesn't succeed? What if the planet they've chosen actually sucks at the end of that long journey? What place will ship crew even serve in a community like that? Are either of those things even something that my sleeper could change by being on the ship? And what about the other people my sleeper would be leaving here on the eye? They'd become a fixture of Yadigan. Rabia and Sabine would need them to help rebuild. The work they'd done at the Haifa commune was not nothing. The ship had begun to provide for them in ways Celis never could. Who was going to give my sleeper stabilizer? How would they even survive the trip? And what would Caster's tracking software mean for Lem and Mina's safety? What would it mean for their own safety, their health, their mental health? And what about Emphis? They would miss just stories followed by quiet moments in his stall. But the thing that ultimately made my decision was something within all of those things. Our sleepers started this journey through escape. They came to the eye stuffed in a storage container, escaping a corporate slaver. If they left now, nothing about this next journey promised to make that first one worth it. Their body would probably break down within weeks, meaning Lem and Mina would be without them. The time that they did have would be spent being used as a tool for the betterment of a man who did not care about them. A man who only cared about what they could give him. There was no escaping the body as an arb had given them. But the eye was a safer place to be a sleeper than the sidereal horizon. Lem, on the other hand, saw the ship as his and Mina's only chance to escape. And crucially, to him, escape was still important. I, again, could not presume to decide for him whether or not he should stay on the eye. And for what it's worth, this seems to be a popular opinion, as I can find zero footage on YouTube of anyone playing the ending where you just don't tell Lem and Mina about the Celis IDs and the three of you stay on the eye together. But whatever I felt about Lem, my sleeper had already had their escape. What my sleeper needed now was a home, and from the moment we traded our first story to Emphis for soup, I knew they could find it here. Now was not the time to run away. No matter how awful it was to read the game's description of Lem and Mina watching my sleeper stay behind. You can't do it. You can't get on that ship. You turn away quickly, trying not to look at Lem, to look at Mina, to meet their eyes. You turn away and kick off hard from the guardrail. When you reach the far wall, you turn back. The scene continues in front of you as if nothing has changed. The next set of people are boarding. The crowds are still gathered at the cordon. The sidereal horizon still blinks, its yellow hull bright against the stars. And there are Lem and Mina, gliding up towards the docking bridge, bag in hand. Lem is facing away, focused on the steady climb, but Mina is in his arms and is facing back towards you. You watch her face, confused, sullen, but twinkling with a growing excitement as Lem carries her forward. As you watch Mina, you think about your future, about the future you might choose. You know one thing for certain, that future is here on the eye. You no longer have any enthusiasm for being carried forward by the dreams of others, for grand futures that unfold like angelic wings across the horizon. The future is being made now, on this spinning ring, among its people and its systems. You're sure of that. But as you watch Mina disappear into the entrance of the sidereal horizon, and much later, when you watch the ship pull away, you feel a sense of longing. A longing to be carried, not by the systems that spend the suns or the corporations that run the colonies, but by love, toward an uncertain future, just as Mina was. That, you think, is the future you wish to make here, on Erlen's Eye. After Lem and Mina left, the credits rolled. I sat with my hands on the sides of my face, thinking about what I'd just done, and what my sleeper would do next. For me, this was the end of the game, but 
I imagined that my sleeper would go back to Emphis. They'd have a bowl of soup, tell the story of their day, and sit in a knowing silence together for a bit. I imagined them going back to the apartment in the low end and waking up in the morning to go see if Yadigan needed any help in the neighborhood. Giving back to the low end, the place where their friends once lived, would help ease the pain. I imagined them living a life never quite stable and never free of the struggle of a visible disability, but also a life among people they trusted and cared for and who helped them live and who they helped too. A full life in every way. The eye, as broken as it was, would be their home. I started writing this video months ago, before my aunt died, before we cared for her in her final weeks in her home, before she even went to the hospital the last time. The thing that my aunt and I had in common, though, is that we both left where we were born and found new family in a place that would seem foreign to the family that we grew up with. We both found value in a new place. For her, it was the suburbs of Houston. For my husband and me, it's been many places, all of them queerer, denser, safer, and often more expensive than Oklahoma. And when I started this video, I didn't know I was about to go through this moment. And I especially didn't expect to go through it not only with my own family, but with the found family that my aunt had built in Houston. The two women she called her sisters were there with us when she died. When my sister, my brother-in-law, and my husband were trading off moments of crying in her living room the next morning, simply because the house was so empty, it was her sister that came running over with food and company. The man she called her brother, who used to work with her at her hospital for several years, flew in from Chicago two weekends in a row. The first time to say goodbye, and the second to deliver her eulogy and have a meal with us. I've seen again what these kinds of communities can do for each other. I've spent more time with my sister in the last few months than I have in the last 10 years, and it's been kind of nice. It's not that I regret any choices that I've made up to this point, but rather that we had this one very concentrated emotional experience among all of the pain and malaise, and it felt once again like my feet were planted firmly. Like for a bit there, there was something I could rely on. This summer marked a year since we moved back to Tulsa. If you're still following, you might expect me to talk about how we're staying, how we've built a community here, how that's what keeps me going when everything else sucks. And that's a lie I told myself for a little bit. The truth is that isolation really is built into the suburban lifestyle, and queerness, while not a secret, is not nearly as open or expected here as in the places where I felt most comfortable. And in a time where the loss of Roe v. Wade is affecting many of the people in my life directly, it is also explicitly linked to Obergefell and several other civil rights at the federal level. And in that world, I don't trust Oklahoma to protect me. I can't disable a tracker and have people stop knowing that I'm queer. So as it stands, we're leaving. At some point. I don't know when, and I don't know where quite yet. There's a bunch of financial reasons why right now, and frankly even this year, is too soon. But it's gonna happen at some point. I know what I value in a place, and I wanna go find it. A place where my husband and I can make a home for ourselves and be a part of something more. When I originally wrote this part, I was a lot angrier at the world. Much lonelier. I'm still angry at, like, the bigger picture of it all. I'm still lonely in some really basic March 2020 level ways, but I've really had to come back and edit myself because it sucks to tell the world that you moved home and that maybe it didn't work out like you'd hoped, when you know that the people you love who live on either side of that move will probably be watching. But I believe there will come a time to move on. Because my life is not my sleepers. Tulsa, Oklahoma is not Erlen's eye. In the real world, I don't believe true escape is possible. Each home that we could make would have its own challenges, but I know that there are more places that can be home than here. And I know that many of them provide me and my family some really fundamental shit this place doesn't. In fact, I've already lived in some of those places that provide me those things, so who knows? Maybe we'll start there. Citizen Sleeper's quest system is organized into various drives, which are in my experience a bit longer than your average video game quest. But one of the longest ones is simply called Get to Know Emphis. It requires these very specific mushrooms, mushrooms that seem impossible to get until you realize that they're basically only available on the far end of the space station, or rather, near the end of the game. In the lead up to this, you've gone back to Emphis several times to either buy a bowl of soup and replenish your health, or occasionally to tell him a story in exchange for a bowl of soup. Once you complete this quest and bring Emphis these elusive mushrooms, he flips the script. 
He tells you his story. Amphis was also once a corporate slave. His body is also a painful reminder of a time where he was used to make someone else wealthy at the expense of himself and of what it took to survive after. He doesn't say it, but I think Amphis chose to befriend our sleeper because he saw they shared the same kinds of pain. I think he knew that even if it would take time to share his own story, that simply being in the presence of someone that had been hurt in the ways that he had and listening to their stories, sharing a bowl of soup, would be good for both of them. Amphis, if I really get down to it, is the reason my sleeper stayed. When the credits rolled, my sleeper came back to see Amphis, where I imagine they maybe shared a story or maybe just sat in silence today. Amphis would know the sidereal had left and that my sleeper hadn't. Surely he'd have known about Lim by now, about Mina, and he'd just be there for them as long as they needed, in between customers shuffling through his kitchen and just being another body in the same space. An example of why my sleeper had made the choice they'd made. They'd thank him, and they'd leave, and they'd walk back through the low end to the place they'd fixed up for themselves. They'd walk slow and think of everything this place and these people had meant to them. How they'd come here expecting to escape again as soon as possible, and how instead, they'd found a home. Maybe it would be something like the scene from the end of the Yad Again story, the last time our sleepers saw Rabia or Sabine, when they took a similar walk through the low end, holding the last few vials of stabilizer they'd be able to find for a while a parting gift from a friend. But S and Arp doesn't own you anymore. They can't, because this place, these people, own you. They are what makes you get up every cycle. They are what keeps you breathing. You put the vials away and walk through the low end, your senses tuned to every sight, every spell and every sound, soaking it all in, living.